What happens when a superpower dies? What happens when the geopolitical order that has stabilized the world for several decades crumbles? Well, we're about to find out. For most of the past century, the United States of America has been the world's single greatest guarantor of global stability. Without American might in World Wars I and II, Europe would have been devoured by a German-led military takeover. After the Second World War, America stimulated the fastest period of growth in Europe's history. It provided massive aid that propelled the ravaged continent toward prosperity. Along the way, the United States rebuilt and stabilized much of war-torn Asia. It held communism in check in Eastern Europe and in Asia. It eventually brought down the Soviet Union. The period is called Pax Americana, and it prevailed in the Western Hemisphere for much of the 20th century. It reigned throughout the Western world since World War II. Since the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, the United States has been the lone world superpower. But now, Pax Americana joins Pax Britannica and Pax Romana. It's history. America's ability to influence other nations is in tatters. Its credibility has been shattered. America's will to cause political change in other nations is broken. The era of the United States is over. Now you probably realize that America isn't what it used to be, but do you fully grasp the magnitude of this historical turning point? America has faded and its enemies are ecstatic. They're working hard to erase America's influence entirely. Here in America, many people are actually relieved that the U.S. is surrendering its powerful role. The big question now is what happens next? The Philadelphia Church of God presents The Trumpet Daily. When people speak of the Western Hemisphere, they often talk about transformations that have taken place. But the truth is, one of the biggest transformations has happened right here in the United States of America. In the early days of our republic, the United States made a choice about its relationship with Latin America. President James Monroe, who was also a former Secretary of State, declared that the United States would unilaterally and as a matter of fact act as the protector of the region. The doctrine that bears his name asserted our authority to step in and oppose the influence of European powers in Latin America. And throughout our nation's history, successive presidents have reinforced that doctrine and made a similar choice. Today, however, we have made a different choice. The era of the Monroe Doctrine is over. The relationship, that's worth applauding, that's not a bad thing. <laughs> the relationship that we seek and that we have worked hard to foster is not about a United States declaration about how and when it will intervene in the affairs of other American states. It's about all of our countries viewing one another as equals. That was a clip from a speech Secretary of State John Kerry gave last week in Washington, D.C. Uh, before the Organization of American States. And as you can see there from that clip, he was saying that the, the James Monroe Doctrine is dead. This is a doctrine established by uh, the president, former president back in 1823, 
And the doctrine basically said that any attempt by European nations to colonize land either in North or South America would be seen as a, an act of aggression here in the United States and that it could trigger uh, U.S. intervention. But that doctrine, as the Secretary of State explained last week, is dead. Today we live in a world of equals, as he said there in that, that clip, and America is no longer viewed as the, the protector of the Americas. And I think it's interesting, we're not talking here about the Middle East or Asia or, or even Europe. We're talking about America's own backyard. And what the Secretary of State said last week is that America will no longer impose its authority uh, over its own neighborhood here in the Americas. Now, this is not a surprise to us at the trumpet. I mean, we've been uh, following this, particularly since uh, the new administration came in back in 2009. If you remember, going back to President Obama's first speech before the United Nations in September of 2009, he said, in an era when our destiny is shared, power is no longer a zero-sum game. He said, no one nation, no one nation uh, can or should try to dominate another nation. He's had this uh, community of nations approach from the get-go. We're a nation among equals. Mr. Obama said, no world order that elevates one nation or group of people over another will succeed. And so now we're beginning to see what life is like in a world that's free of American dominance. The decline of America, of course, is not something that's just been unique to this administration. I mean, it's been going on now for a period of, of decades, uh, going back before the Obama administration. But when you have leaders in the current administration announcing the fact that things like the Monroe Doctrine is dead, or announcing the fact that Pax Americana is over. It says a lot about where we happen to be these past few weeks in particular, or the last couple of months. We've seen, as we'll talk a little bit later on in the program with the managing editor of the Trumpet Magazine, Joel Hilliker, uh, but we've really arrived at a turning point, going back to uh, what happened with Syria and the strong stance that America took initially the promise to attack Syria, and then of course the hedging that happened soon after, and then Russia swooping in to propose that sham agreement, and the United States really looking weak and foolish through it all. There was the, the shameful phone call, which we've talked about uh, on a few programs, when the President of the United States called uh, President Rouhani of Iran as he was leaving the United, United Nations Conference uh, back in September, early October. Now, to that point, I mean, the United States was seen as the number one constraint on the number one state sponsor of world terrorism. And after this call, I mean, that really sent shockwaves around the world. And it led right into the negotiations in Geneva, which started a few weeks ago and then were finalized, that interim agreement finalized just this past weekend. We talked about that on yesterday's program. Carolyn Glick called it the most significant international event since the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. The most significant event in over 20 years. Why? What is so significant about this agreement? She explained, the collapse of the Soviet Union signaled the rise of the United States as the sole global superpower the developments in the six-party nuclear talks with Iran in Geneva last week signaled the end of American world leadership. And of course, since uh, this deal uh, was finalized, we've learned more details about it, how that the negotiations were going on secretly since March, how that the administration was easing sanctions even as early as this past summer. And now, of course, it's out, wide out in the open where the sanctions have been lifted to the tune of seven or eight billion dollars and the enrichment continues, no dismantling of Iran's uh, nuclear program. This is a quote from the latest edition of the Trumpet Magazine. What happens next? 
What happens after a superpower dies? That's the theme of this most recent issue of The Trumpet. And in the, the issue, the managing editor, Joel Hilliker, writes, Washington's willingness to sell out its Middle Eastern allies in order to come to terms with Iran is pivotal. He says it marks the end of U.S. influence in the region. It will surely lead to Iran cementing its dominance. In addition, it puts all of America's global alliances in doubt, it says, leaving Saudi Arabia's and Israel's the world over scrambling for alternative arrangements to guarantee their own security. He writes, the fallout will be enormous. Let's just go through a few verses today in Daniel chapter 5. If you'd like to read along, we'll uh, look at this history with uh, a Babylonian king that thought everything was fine and that the empire would just continue on forever. Before we read that, I just want to give you one quote from Mark Stein's book, Amer uh, After America. The subtitle you can see there says, Get Ready for Armageddon. This is a book from 2011, just a couple of years ago. And uh, in it, he describes uh, what the world will be like without a dominant American policeman. He says on page 277, the world after America is beginning to uh, take shape, he writes. There will be no new world order, only a world with no order in which pipsqueak failed states go nuclear while the planet's wealthiest nations are unable to defend their borders and are forced to adjust to the post-American era as they can. It says, yet in such a geopolitical scene, Whatever survives of the United States will still be the most inviting target. That's quite a statement. I mean, I read through this and wonder if he even realizes what he's saying. I mean, just the subtitle, get ready for Armageddon. But here he says our demise, it's going to make us a most inviting target. It's not like enemies are just going to turn and run from us or leave us alone or ignore us. The faster we fall the more appealing that target uh, is going to look to enemies abroad. It says the United States will still be the most inviting target, first because it's big, and second because, as Britain knows, the Durbar moves on, but imperial resentments linger long after imperial grandeur. So that's from uh, Mark Stein's book, After America. Now I want to take you to this passage here in uh, Daniel chapter 5 and verse 1, where it says, Belshazzar... The king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Here is uh, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. Nebuchadnezzar started this, this world empire. And uh, by this point in, uh, in time, the, the empire had weakened significantly. And yet Belshazzar just thought the power was always going to remain and that the kingdom would continue. In verses 2 through 4, you can see how he throws this, this disdainful, riotous uh, feast shaking his fist at God. And verse 5 says, In the same hour uh, came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance was changed and his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his loins were loosed and his knees smote one against another. And so here appears this hand right up against the wall, a hand of him by itself, writing a message into the wall of the king's palace. Down in verse 13, it says, Then was Daniel brought in. Well, the king brought in all the astrologers and, and the magicians of, of his, his uh, kingdom. They couldn't figure out what the meaning was. He brings in Daniel in verse uh, 13. He knew all about him uh, from his interpretation of, of dreams with God's help and inspiration. Verse 17, notice it says, Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let your gifts be to yourself and give your rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing unto the king and make known to him the interpretation. Daniel wasn't in it for material things. He wasn't going to try to raid the treasury even as the kingdom came crashing down. He wanted to give this man the truth, the truth as it came from God about what was coming. Because even as this hand was writing on the wall, the Median and Persian armies were sneaking into the city. They were feasting away in the palace and the enemies were surrounding 
the empire. Verse 30, it says, In that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain, and Darius the Median took the kingdom, being about threescore and two years old. So the mighty Babylonian empire came crashing down that night. Mr. Armstrong uh, referred to this history in his book, The United States and Britain in Prophecy, a book that tells us what's coming for the United States, what's ahead, what God has prophesied. And he writes in that book, do you think so great a fall could not come to so great powers as Britain and America? He asked that in the United States and Britain in Prophecy. He asked that actually well over a half century ago. Back when America, I mean, was the superpower that controlled so much of what happened in this world. He says, you need to open your eyes to the fact that Britain's sun already has set. And, he says later, the United States is fast riding to the greatest fall that ever befell any nation. He said the handwriting is on the wall. It certainly is. In fact, that's a, a theme that, that Mark Stein picks up on in his book, After America, comparing America today to Belshazzar's Babylon, saying that we're not just facing decline, we're in it. We're in the midst of a free fall. What comes next, he asked, is the fall fast, sudden, off the cliff. So in other words, the pace of prophetic events, even if he lacks the understanding of what God has prophesied, he certainly can see a lot of what, what is happening in this world. And you can see a lot more by looking to what God has said about where we are and where we're headed. Much of that is discussed and covered in this latest issue of the Trumpet Magazine. What happens next? Life in the post-American world. You're going to want to make sure that you, uh, if you haven't already, that you subscribe to this magazine or, or call our offices and make sure you get this specific issue. Uh, after the break, we're going to sit down and talk with the managing editor of the Trumpet Magazine, Joel Hilliker. Jesus Christ prophesied that we are about to enter a time when America's and Britain's global influence will be snuffed out and Gentile powers will wreak unimaginable havoc on the earth. This seismic shift in geopolitical momentum away from America and toward a clutch of non-Israelite Gentile powers accompanied by an escalation in brutal violence and war is actually good news ultimately. It is one of the signs Jesus Christ gave of His imminent return. The darkness and evil that are about to flood this globe presage the most wonderful news in human history. The most recent issue of the Trumpet Magazine illuminates this sign, the geopolitical shift in favor of this world's growing Gentile powers. In this issue, the Trumpet looks squarely at where the reshaping of the Middle East is leading. It examines what we can expect a post-American Europe to look like in the time ahead. It exposes how the Asian landscape will be transformed when that continent's native powers return to dominance. It takes an unblinking look at just what this world should expect when the early indications we see today explode into their full scope. It shows how all of these events are already lining up perfectly to unfold in precise accordance with the Bible's prophetic outline. This issue also discusses the hope of physical protection God affords those who put their trust in Him and the far greater hope of a new world governed by God, which will begin when the darkness has passed. Soon we will look back upon the problems making headlines today and recognize that they were merely, as Jesus Christ termed it, the beginning of sorrows. The time for complacency is past. Visit thetrumpet.com to receive a free one-year subscription to The Trumpet Magazine.
All right, we're back with Joel Hilliker, the managing editor of the Trumpet magazine. And as you can see from the title here, what happens next, life in the post American world. Maybe you can begin by telling us why, why you would corral these many articles together and write on this subject now. Uh, well, this has really been a, a pretty interesting time the last couple of months. Obviously, there's been uh, a decline in United States power for quite a long time, for quite a number of years, but the last couple of months have just been uh, really phenomenal in the developments that we've seen, just uh, the way that the president handled the situation in Syria, um, turning the situation over to Russia, basically expecting Russia to deal with uh, the weapons of mass destruction and the chemical weapons in, in Syria. These are types of things that really changed the whole calculus for a lot of countries in the, in the Middle East in particular, but a lot of countries are looking at what's happening in the United States and saying, well, what happens next? They're asking this exact question. With the United States power declining this much, then uh, this really changes the game for all of us. And one of the things you point out in your article is how that even in the United States, there's quite a few people who actually see this decline and look at it as a good thing. Uh, and then you go on to point out why they should be concerned. So why should they be concerned about what's happening? Well, if you, if you think about the 20th century, we call it like the, the time of Pax Americana, that this has been uh, a unprecedented American dominance for, for the greater part of this century. After World War II, uh, the time from World War II until now, we call that the long peace, that there's been no major wars between great powers, and the United States has had a tremendous part in that. The, the United States adding its power to uh, what happened at the end of World War I, adding its power to World War II, uh, and essentially uh, enabling Europe to avoid being dominated by a German empire that was trying to take over the whole, uh, the whole continent. Um, if you don't have America going in there, if you don't have America helping out there, then, then life is very different in Germany. It's very different all over Europe. It's different for Britain and France. Uh, America was the, the power that really did the, the greatest work in checking communism, preventing the spread of communism all over Asia and into Europe. So here's two of the most aggressive empires, say, of the, of the 20th century that uh, they could have changed everything. They're just a very aggressive, imperialistic type powers, uh, national socialism and communism. What happens if you don't have someone there, if you don't have a strong power keeping that in check? Uh, everything is different. And, and the fact that the United States is declining, you have countries, obviously Israel and Saudi Arabia are looking at, at uh, the reconciliation that the United States is making with Iran and saying, okay, if you're not going to help us, if you're not going to keep Iran in check, then who do we go to? Who do we look to? What happens next? They're, they're really contemplating what does life in a post-American world look like. Asia is the same thing. Russia is very aggressive. China is very aggressive. And so you have nations like Japan, like South Korea, the Philippines, Taiwan, that are looking at this and saying, well, okay, if America isn't going to guarantee our security, what happens next? And there's an article in here uh, Jeremiah Jacques wrote about Asia and just looking at what are the, the powers that are left behind. If there's no one to check Russia, if there's no one to check China, what does the world look like? What does Asia look like with those leaders in power? Who are these men and what, what are they going to do if there's no one there to, to keep them in line, basically? So you mentioned the, the article on Asia. The whole issue is pretty much divided up into these looks at each region around the world. Uh, what else can you tell us about this issue that might be of interest to our, uh, our viewers? A uh, really important uh, article in there that I think ties in with the theme is um, the one that Mr. Gerald Fleury, your father, wrote about uh, the nuclear weapons that the United States has left behind in Europe. In some ways, here's a, a very real look at life in the post-American world. We put those uh, weapons there during the Cold War as a means of checking um, the, the Soviet Union, and they're still there. There's still a, hundred, you know, a couple of hundred of them left behind that are fitted to the, the 
the nations, the host nations, we've got four European nations, including Italy and Germany, our enemies in World War II, many of them in Turkey, which is turning very radically Islamist. Um, and what are they going to do with those nuclear weapons? If the United States doesn't really have them secured, and there's a lot of evidence to show that it doesn't, then what happens to those weapons? And again, it's, it's, uh, it's looking at what the world might look like once America is, is out and these other powers are coming in with that kind of, of weaponry, that kind of uh, firepower, it, it, it changes the, uh, the look of the world considerably. So all that and more in the latest issue of the Trumpet Magazine. That's the January 2014 issue. Uh, if you're not a subscriber already, you can go to thetrumpet.com and get your free subscription uh, today. So to conclude with today, we, uh, NASA last week uh, launched a spacecraft to Mars in hopes of finding out uh, why it's so desolate on that planet. And we've prepared a, a three or four minute feature to conclude today's program with. So you can enjoy that as we say our goodbyes. Thanks for joining us today, and we'll see you next time on the Trumpet Daily. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Main engine start, ignition, and liftoff of the Atlas V with Maven. NASA's newest robotic explorer rocketed toward Mars on November 18th. The MAVEN explorer is on a quest to unravel the ancient mystery. Why has the red planet's climate changed so radically? The spacecraft is due to reach Mars next autumn, following a journey of more than 440 million miles. Scientists think that Mars used to have large bodies of water and a much warmer climate. They think it may originally have been capable of supporting life. They want to know why Mars is now an utterly dry wasteland. To help solve this puzzle, MAVEN will spend an entire Earth year measuring atmospheric gases once it reaches Mars on September 22, 2014. Unlike the 2011 launched Curiosity rover, MAVEN will conduct its experiments from orbit around Mars. It will dip as low as 78 miles above the Martian surface, sampling the atmosphere. This is NASA's 21st mission to Mars since the 1960s, but so far, proof of life has been elusive. It's only a little over 50 years ago that we first sent a planetary probe into space to move from just myth and fable to actually observation and measurements. So we now have evidence with uh, other measurements showing that there is water flowing on the surface of Mars. We know that it was the environment at one point in time on Mars was able to support microbial life. But you look at the Mars today, it's cold, it's dry. We wanna know what happened. Something clearly happened. Water was abundant on early Mars. The environment was something that was capable of supporting liquid water. Yet today we see a cold, dry planet that is not able to support water. What we want to do is to understand what are the reasons for that change in the climate. Previous missions to Mars focused around finding life on the planet. The shift to trying to understand why Mars has become desolate is a step in the right direction. Yet, if scientists would only look to the Bible for answers, they would know why Mars is in such a state of decay. The Bible reveals that many years ago, perhaps millions of years ago, there was a war in the universe. Lucifer and one-third of the angels rebelled against God. It was the most destructive war ever, leaving Mars and apparently the rest of the universe in a state of decay. Two Bible chapters, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, give many of the details leading up to that war. But as hard as it might be to believe, that war is the very reason you were created. In a 2004 article titled, Mars Reveals Your Universe Potential, Trumpet Editor-in-Chief Gerald Fleury writes, Why do our scientists want to reach Mars? It keeps getting back to one overall question. Is there life on Mars? But they are asking the wrong question. Mr. Fleury continues. 
They should ask, why is Mars and the universe there? As Gerald Flurry brings out in that article, the Bible reveals that mankind is destined to remove that decay from Mars and the entire universe. It is mankind's job to make the universe look like the Garden of Eden. That is man's destiny, and you can prove it from the Bible. For biblical proof that man's ultimate destiny includes bringing life to Mars and the entire universe, request a free copy of Herbert W. Armstrong's book, The Incredible Human Potential, and Our Awesome Universe Potential by Joel Hilliker.